Unity of Houston is an inclusive church where we seek to understand and live the teachings of Jesus and other spiritual masters. At Unity, we welcome all people from all spiritual paths and every walk of life. We celebrate the diversity of our city and of our world, and we teach love, tolerance, and oneness, seeking to live in harmony with open minds and open hearts. Wherever you are in your spiritual path, you are always welcome at Unity. Join us and discover that the life of your dreams is already within you. Oh, and she can sing, or she can sing. <laughs> she has uh, um, traveled the world. She was uh, a featured uh, vocalist with Rod Stewart for many, many years. She has been on Oprah, y'all. She is really something else. She is here to share this new, deeper level of the work that God is calling her to, to help us all heal. And I'm so pleased and honored to say not only is she a, a, a beloved and respected colleague, but she is my friend. Please welcome Esther Nicholson. Give him a baby. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> Woo! Thank you, Unity of Houston. Thank you, my, my brother. I started to call him my mother. My brother, <laughs> Michael Gott. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you for being one of my communities, one of my homes. I hope y'all don't make me move here and be with y'all. There's a song that I want to sing for you called I Believe This Belongs to You. And I wrote this song several years ago with my dear friends, Jan Garrett and J.D. Martin. And we sat down in a songwriting session and they said, what do you want to write about? And I said, I want to write about forgiveness. And there's this amazing story about Martin Luther King and forgiveness and standing in the truth of who he was independent of what was coming at him from other people. So I'm inviting each and every one of you right now to call forth someone, bring into your awareness someone that you've been holding resentment towards. Resentment is the remembering, the retelling, and the reliving of a painful event, even if that event is in the past, that we're continuing to retell it, re-trigger ourselves with it, and re-traumatize ourselves with the story. So I invite you to just bring that person or those people or that group into your mind right now that you feel has offended you in any way as you listen to the words of this song. I once heard a powerful story about a man who stood in his truth with such conviction in who he was he would not be moved someone stepped out of the crowd and said are you Martin Luther King he said, yes, I am, and the well-dressed man spit on him. But King took out his handkerchief and wiped the hate from his suit. He gave it back to the man and said, I believe this belongs to you. I will lift you high. I'll do what I can do. Cause I see your heart and, and I know your pain. I've been there too. I will hold you high while you do what you have to do. Can I get an amen? Because I am clear who is standing here. I believe this belongs to you. Are you ready to give up those stories that's been holding you in bondage? Can I, yes? So I had a story. You see, I once had a powerful story. I used to carry around. Thought it was you all this time 
who held my spirit down but now I know the truth of who I came here to be see you are my angel in disguise not my enemy so I thank you for the part you played in this dance we had to do I give you back the love that's real I believe this belongs to you sing with me I will lift you up I'll do I'll do what I can do I see your heart I see your heart I know your pain I've been there too I will hold you high I will hold you high while you do what you have to do cause I am clear who is standing here I believe this belongs to you let me hear you I'll do, I'll do what I can do. I see your heart, I see your heart and I have, I've even felt your pain. Cause I've been there too. I will hold you high while you do what you have to do. Cause I am clear who is standing here. I believe this belongs to you. I give you back the love that's real. I believe this belongs to you. Amen. I believe this belongs to you, the love that is real, the love that sometimes gets a little numbed out, but it is immutable, it is unlimited, unlimiting, it is unchanging, it is who we are. It is the very essence from which we were created. I'm here to talk to you today, Unity of Houston. I'm here to talk to Houston. I'm here to talk to the world about compassionate accountability, healing unconscious racial bias. Note that I, that I did not say guilt-ridden accountability or shamed-based accountability, but compassionate accountability. I'm not here to shame white people or make white people feel guilty. And I'm not here to undermine the pain and the plight and everything that people of color, black indigenous and people of color, black, Latina, Asian, and people of color have been through. I'm not here to undermine that, and I'm not here to make anyone feel guilty. I'm here to connect with you and to activate within each and every one of you compassion. Not only for other races and cultures, but compassion for your own unconscious racial bias. Because all of us have been racially and culturally traumatized to some degree, and all of us have embodied on an unconscious level racial bias. I'm very blessed to be coming up on 37 years of recovery. Thank you. I've been an agape licensed practitioner for 26 years. And in all transparency, sometimes I just think I know everything. <laughs> Am I the only one with that problem? Let me see. Let me see. Sometimes I just think I know everything, especially before I started doing this deep work on compassion and accountability. I thought I knew everything about my own unconscious racial bias, about my own racial bias, because I was so unconscious about it. I'm like, I'm a black woman. How can I have unconscious racial bias? 
But when we do this work and we go into this, this, this vibration of microscopic, rigorous honesty and self-examination, we can look at those places within ourselves from a place of humility and compassion. So my recovery has taught me that thinking that I know everything is actually a brilliant strategy of my ego mind to keep me stuck in what is familiar and what it thinks is safe. So I have a process that I use when I find that my mind has snapped shut against everyone else's point of view but my own. And it's called the set aside prayer, where I give myself permission to put aside everything I think I know in order to be fully available to the infinite wisdom, wisdom and divine intelligence of the universe. I give myself permission to get out of my own way. So I'm going to invite you, beloveds, before I get deeply into the talk, to get out of your own way by repeating the set-aside prayer after me, if you're so inclined. But first of all, I want you to grab your wrist right here, which is an acupuncture point, and I want you to inhale deeply, and exhale on the word peace as you repeat after me. I put aside everything I think I know about my racial bias. I set aside everything I think I know about the racial bias of others. I set aside every experience, opinion and perspective, position and point of view I have on this matter. I put it all aside for an open mind, an open heart, and a new experience. Inhale deeply, and let go. Soul Recovery is a program that I created over 15 years ago that provides individuals, groups, communities, organizations, everyone a clear and comp God bless you, that provides everyone with a clear and comprehensive roadmap to their highest and authentic self, back to their true identity, back to their divine destiny, the self that was in existence before it was numbed out by trauma, false beliefs, and other constructive patterns. I was inspired to create this work because I needed a spiritual practice that would help me stop battling the illusions I held about myself. I had to shift my recovery focus to recovering from my addictions and feelings of unworthiness and my life being unmanageable to the recovery of something greater than the self that I was familiar with, the self that lived in the illusion of separation and false identity. I had to go on a journey of recovering, rediscovering, and reawakening to my very soul. You beloved, are on a journey of rediscovering your soul. The reality of you that is an individualized expression of God, the infinite, whole, perfect, complete, and who knows nothing about otherness. It doesn't know race, creed, casting systems, socioeconomic status, sexual orientations, or any other differences. It only knows oneness and glorifies itself in the beauty of all of its unique creation and forms. Can I get an amen? So we are indeed spiritual beings having a human experience. And in this human experience, when we are living under the illusion of separation and duality, racism, hate, and fear is manifested. But again, higher consciousness, God, the infinite, knows nothing about that. It only knows love. Yet, from a consciousness of separation and duality, we in the world are attempting to practice anti-racism and anti-bias from a vibrational frequency that is actually a part of the problem versus being in alignment with the solution. When I found myself being emotionally battered in long-term recovery by chronic fear and anxiety and feelings of unworthiness, 
I discovered that the reason I wasn't moving forward in my life was because I was attempting to awaken to my wholeness and sense of safety from a broken perspective that was out of alignment with my true identity. Can any of you relate to that? I discovered that as long as I was attempting to recover from my intergenerational trauma and destructive emotional patterns from a broken perspective, that I was repetitively sending incoherent signals to my brain, my nervous system, my cells, and my entire anatomy that this assessment of myself was true. So therefore, I kept manifesting the same emotions and same destructive patterns. Yes? So in order to get unstuck and move forward in an effective and sustainable way, I had to have a spiritual awakening about my very identity because I wasn't seeing life as it really was. I was seeing life from whom I falsely believed I was, sick, broken, and hopeless. And based on spiritual law, God only knows you as it created you. But the laws of the universe can only reflect back to you who you think you are. Can I get an amen? A lot of us are seeing the world right now as divisive, sick, broken, and hopeless. The world has hit an all-time low and is having a collective identity crisis. We are being pushed by crisis, pain, and terror to heal and to wake up to our true identity. But I'd like to offer you the idea that we can stop being pushed and motivated by fear and terror and every headline in the news right now and start being pulled by a higher vision. We don't want to be anti-racism. We don't want to be anti-bias. We want to be pro-equality, pro-diversity, pro-inclusion, and pro-oneness. We want to turn away from the appearance of racism, not by denying it, but by focusing our attention and intentions on a higher reality, which then guides us to divine right action. How, we do, how do we do that, though? How do we do that when the world is so divisive, so hateful, so filled with fear, and there's horrific story after horrific story of death and murder in the news on an hourly basis? How do we do that? I'm going to tell you in a minute. We cannot do it from our human consciousness. It was Jesus the Christ, one of the most revered spiritual masters, who said, what did he say? Of myself, I can do nothing. It was Einstein who said we cannot solve problems by using the same thinking we used when we created them. And the first step of the 12-step recovery process states that the aspect of myself that's in the problem, in the addiction, that created the problem, is actually powerless and our life has become unmanageable. Yes? The world is on fire. The world is in a recovery moment. The world has hit a bottom. And I want you to think about that, that the world has hit a bottom. And I want you to say, yes! Yay, because how are many of us motivated to change and grow? It's usually when we hit a bottom, even though as we continue to evolve, we don't have to hit that much of a bottom to be pulled by the vision. But the world has hit a bottom right now. And we can't heal racial bias from the level of the problem because from that place, we are operating at a frequency of fear, shame, blame, accusations, and comparing traumas. And my friends, that's not working. Is that working? It's not working. What we resist persists. That's spiritual law, nothing personal. But we can be transformed by the renewal of our minds. We can align with our spiritual identity of oneness and wholeness. And from that consciousness, the crooked places are made straight and all things are restored to divine and perfect order. Martin Luther King said that if we stand, if we don't stand for something, we will fall for anything. And I want you to feel the difference right now as we resist, as we resist racism, as we resist bias, as we resist anyone and everything that thinks or looks differently from us. I want you to just hold out your hands right now and feel as if you're pushing up against a brick wall all the time. Just feel how hard and how much effort that takes. And now I want you to inhale deeply. I want you to let go so that you feel the difference between pushing it away, resisting, trying to make something happen, 
versus allowing what's waiting for us. That's within us. That's been within us all the time. Now, this does not mean that we are hide out in denial about the state of the world or be in denial about the atrocities that have committed, that have been committed upon black, Latina, Asian, and people of color by whites and by each other. Let me say that again. By whites and by each other, as, as demonstrated in the killing that happened in the beginning of the year where Tyrese Nichols in Memphis was killed by five black police officers while white officers, Latino officers, and other black officers stood by and watched. Why? Because we are suffering from cultural trauma, intergenerational cultural trauma, and we keep trying to do the topical work without connecting to the soul of each and every one of us. So no, addressing racial bias from our higher consciousness isn't about being in denial. What it means is that we've got to go deeper than ever before on a spiritual and emotional level to heal systemic and institutionalized racism. We have to do more than just reading books, participating in DEIB trainings, shaming white people and changing policy, because while racism is systemic, it is spiritual and emotional in nature. And what is spiritual and emotional in nature must be addressed from that consciousness. Can I get an amen? So what is unconscious racial bias? There are a lot of people who believe with all their heart and soul that they are not racist and do not harbor any racial bias towards anyone. And with all due respect, I'd like to say that the majority of people on this planet are racist or biased against people who look, think, and behave differently than themselves or who come from different parts of the world. And I want you to look at that especially if you're coming to the workshop this afternoon on compassion and accountability, that whatever comes into your awareness, this is not an invitation to be ashamed. This is an invitation to become aware. That what we bring into our awareness, we cannot heal what we're not aware of, and we cannot heal what we won't acknowledge. So this is an opportunity, as it was for me as a black woman who grew up thinking that I was discriminated against, but that I didn't have any discriminations, and boy, that I find out differently. So even though we were created, hold on. So most of us are not aware of our racial bias because it is operating in our unconscious minds, which makes up 90% of our consciousness. And we cannot acknowledge, process, or release what we are not consciously aware of with the other 10% of our consciousness. The 10% of our consciousness we make decisions with is being driven by what's been indoctrinated, embodied, and hardwired in the 90% of our unconscious minds. How many of you knew that? That you walking around thinking, talking, seeing people that are different than you, what happens? Your brain makes a decision before you've even had a chance to filter it. Is that true or am I the only one, right? So even though we were all created out of oneness, most of us were born into a belief system of otherness. We were born into intergenerational beliefs, legacies, paradigms, and patterns, positive and negative. And what we are subjected to for long periods of time becomes deeply ingrained in our unconscious minds without our conscious permission. How many of you have had the opportunity to watch the movie The Help? One of my favorite movies where Viola Davis was in charge of this little beautiful white girl who was two or three years old. And all this white, little white girl knew was love. When she looked at Viola, all she knew was love. She was affirmed, she was being cared for, she saw kindness, she saw love, yet she was being raised in a household, in an environment, in a society that was starting to indoctrinate within her consciousness that if a black person used the indoor toilet that the family would catch a disease. So racism is not something that we were created with. Racism, racial bias, is something that we learned and embodied and put into practice. Can I get an amen? But here's the beauty of that. Ernest Holmes, wonderful founder of religious science, he said, what thought can do, thought can what? What thought can do, thought can what? Undo. We can unlearn it. 
We were all created just like that little girl, pure innocence, open-hearted, as a clear blank canvas to be filled in by what we are consistently exposed to. We learn otherness, we are taught racial bias. And if any narrative is, is forced upon you frequently, forcefully and consistently enough, it is going to become a part of your hardwired unconscious belief system. It's not your fault. I want you to just put your hand on your heart right now and say, it's not my fault. It's not your fault. These beliefs and perceptions have been ingrained in your unconscious mind for centuries generation after generation. So we don't want to be in shame about it. We want to do something about it from a higher state of consciousness. Again, some of you might say, does that mean that we sit around and do nothing? Do we just sit around and let racial bias happen? Absolutely not. In my Martin Luther King talk at the Tacoma Dome a few years ago, I stated that King didn't give us permission to be spiritual wimps or doormats, but he understood that when we surrender to a power greater than ourselves, that that was the power to lift the fog of illusion, part the veil of separation, to give us access to infinite wisdom and divine intelligence, and then from there we would be guided to divine right action. Anger has its place, y'all. Anger's good. I call it passionate preference. <laughs> Anger is good. It's a higher frequency than lethargy, ap apathy, oppression, and depression. Anger gets you moving when used to treat and move your feet. It is a powerful and constructive emotion, and we should get angry. We should not accept anything less than the equality and justice, which is our divine birthright. But when we pull over and park in anger and unhealed cultural trauma, we are continuing to repeat the same destructive patterns, even with well-intentioned motives, while expecting different results. And that's the difference between inching the needle forward and taking a quantum leap into what is possible. Shame and guilt are not necessary. They're not necessary emotions to create change, nor are these emotions productive. White people should not feel ashamed for being white. God created whites in its image and likeness just like it created all people. It is the consciousness of white supremacy that has to be healed. It is the consciousness of unhealed and untapped cultural trauma in all of us, in black, indigenous, and people of color that has to be healed. Because what we fail to heal, we tend to repeat. And we see that playing out in the world today. And I wanna say to every black and indigenous and person of color in this audience today, you're not betraying the ancestors because you heal. You're not betraying the ancestors by being nice to white people. You're not betraying the ancestors by not looking at everything that's being said as racial. We're honoring the ancestors. They went through everything that they went through so we could be free. And that means emotionally and spiritually and in every other way. So you're not, we're, not, we're not leaving our tribe or betraying our people to lift up in higher consciousness and to do this work from that place. Our ancestors are rooting for us. They're not trying to keep us stuck. We're not here to fight racial bias. We're here to awaken to who we really are. And in that recognition, racial bias doesn't exist. Can you feel that for a moment? That in higher consciousness, in the truth of who you are, racial bias and otherness doesn't exist. From this consciousness, only oneness exists. Yet the tulip isn't racist against the rose. The rose isn't biased against the iris. The iris isn't trying to oppress the lily. It's an acknowledgement of the sacred oneness of all life and a celebration of the glory, diversity, and uniqueness of all of God's magnificent creation. You may have been born into racial bias and racial trauma like I was, but we were created out of oneness and wholeness. So let's remember who we are created to be versus what we were born to be. Let's take the filters off and fall in love. Fall in love with each other. 
fall in love with the, all of these wonderful ways in which God is happening, all the wonderful races and cultures that God is happening. Let's look at those differences and say, oh my God, I want to celebrate you. Tell me more about you. Tell me more about your culture. Let me share more with you about mine. From higher consciousness, falling in love, falling in love with you. Because that, my friends, is the way God planned it. Amen? And so it is. Amen. So let's take this moment and take another deep breath and exhale. As we tap into that frequency, into that vibration of oneness that doesn't see anything but itself. It only sees love. It only sees oneness. It only sees good. It only sees infinite possibility, infinite potential. In fact, it sees even more than that. It sees the complete idea of a world that loves each other, a world that supports each other, a world that can look at where we might look different on the inside but recognize that we're all oneness on the inside. And to look at those differences and celebrate each other. And as we, as we go within and we allow this presence and power that is within us, to dissolve into the native nothingness from which it came anything that would appear to be discrimination or racial bias or otherness or fear and anxiety or feeling threatened or shamed in any way, that it is dissolved now into the nothingness from which it came. And we awaken to who we are as expressions of the divine. And this is the consciousness that shifts the world from separation and duality to oneness. And I'm just so grateful and thankful to know this, to live this, to be this, and to be able to share this message with those of you who are so ready for it. And those of you who are not, we can never underestimate the power of planting a seed. We're not here to hate, we're here to love because that is what we were created out of. So I am so grateful as we go forth, as we move forth in our week. Allowing to come up into our awareness what needs to come up now so that it can be processed and released so that we can see our brothers and sisters from an entirely different perspective. But more importantly, we can see ourselves from a higher perspective. God is all that there is. And we are so grateful and thankful to stand in this truth the truth that sets us free. And I release this intention, I release this word into the law knowing that it returns fulfilled, pressed down, running over. Not the news, our own news. We get to make our own news from a higher place of consciousness. It is done. I am grateful. And so it is. Amen. Watching this message today. I'd like to invite you to join us in person here on campus at Unity of Houston for Sunday morning or Wednesday evening services. If you can't be with us here on our campus, you can still join us live on Facebook or on our website, unityhouston.org, Sunday mornings at 11 a.m. Central.